I'm back looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just going through the Bible, talking about it, looking at the words and phrases in each verse. And it's just fun to talk about the Bible. To get up early in the morning and let the first thing you do be talking about the Bible, talking to the Lord, looking at each word and phrase. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. So the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. And it speaks expressly. It mean, That means it speaks plainly. It, you look at the Bible, it's straightforward. I mean, there's some things in the Bible that can be hard to understand. For the most part, it's you just got to believe it. It's not about understanding it. You just look at it and you believe it. And it effectually worketh in you that believe. You approach it as a little child that believes everything that its father says. We approach the Bible. We believe everything that our father says. That's how you approach it, with a childlike faith. Because it speaks expressly. It's plainly. It's not hard to understand. In Mark 12, 37, talking about the Lord, it says the common people heard him gladly. Most likely, if you listen to me on here, you're just a common man because I'm just a regular common person. I'm not a smart guy. I don't have much knowledge in really anything. I'm just a common guy. And the, the common people are the ones who want to hear the Lord the most. The Spirit speaks expressly. It's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 tells you that, that the Lord is not the author of confusion. That would be the devil. He's the author of confusion. He likes to uh, twist things around. He likes to come at you subtly. But the Holy Spirit is not the author of confusion. The Spirit speaks expressly. The Spirit does speak. It's not just left the, the creation here by itself. The Lord talks to us. It speaks expressly. That in the latter times, the later times, we're in the latter times of the church age. Some shall depart from the faith. That's apostasy. They were in the faith in the sense that they had the right doctrines and the, the right gospel at one time, but now they've took on different doctrines, took on another Jesus even, another spirit. And they've given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So these seducing spirits, it's not the same spirit that speaks expressly. It's another spirit, uh, lowercase s, see that? A seducing spirit. So there's another spirit, there's another Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4, it says, But I fear, this is Paul talking, and he says, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See, there's simplicity in Christ. It's not hard to understand. He speaks expressly. He's not the author of confusion. The common people hear him gladly. It's the simplicity in Christ that the devil hates. It's the simplicity in Christ that people want you to get away from because they want you to think that they're so smart and that you got to go to them to know the Bible or to know God. And I have people tell me all the time, well, if you really want to understand the Bible, you got to know Greek and Hebrew or you got to go to some Bible college. No, no, no. The common people heard him gladly. The Spirit speaks expressly. The Lord is not the author of confusion. There's simplicity in Christ. <clears throat> Paul's afraid that the serpent's going to beguile him like he did Eve and their mind's going to be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. See, anytime you want to communicate the Bible to people or the Lord Jesus Christ to people, you want to do it with simplicity, not with great big words, not with enticing words of man's wisdom. 
So he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, so there is another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, so there is another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So there's another Jesus, there's another spirit, there's another gospel. So those are seducing spirits. And another gospel is the doctrine of a devil. And that's what you have today. In most Christian circles, you got another Jesus, you got another spirit, you got another gospel. You go, you look at a lot of church. I don't go to a lot of churches. I just go to my church. But I've, I see churches like on their live streams and stuff. And they got another Jesus. They got a Jesus that's okay with everything and everybody. Uh, a Jesus that doesn't even line up with what he says about himself in the Bible. I mean, I had a guy not too long ago. He, he said to me that Jesus doesn't even really care if you read the Bible. And I'm thinking, well, man, you got another Jesus because Jesus was always saying, have you not read? Have you not read what David did? Have you not read in the scriptures? Jesus was always quoting from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. He, he, said, he would say over and over again, have you not read? Have you not read? Jesus does want you to read the word. When the devil tempted him, he pulled out verses of scripture and said, it is written. It is written. So, things like that is what you get. They've got another Jesus. They got a Jesus that's okay with everything and everybody. They got another spirit that is not a spirit of simplicity that speaks plainly. That's not the author of confusion. They've got this another spirit that wants to take away the simplicity of things and makes you. Uh, Turn away from the King James Bible because they say it's too hard to understand. Isn't that funny? They say that the King James is too hard to understand, and then you listen to them preach or teach, and it's a whole lot harder to understand than anything a, a Bible believer ever said. You listen to a Bible believer, or you read books by Bible believers, it's it's way easier to understand. They, I've noticed that when I read a book by a Bible believer, they use smaller words, words that aren't hard to understand. And it's, it's just like reading just a book that you would a, a child could read. And it's like a Bible believer wants to make it simple. Whereas you get a book by somebody that's not a Bible believer, and it's so much harder to understand. But yet they want to attack us and say, well, I just can't. Read the King James because it's so hard to understand. Well, my daughter can read it, and she's in second grade. She reads it. She understands it. I mean, obviously, there's words in there that you don't, you're not going to know, but that's just like with anything. Anytime you take on something, you have to learn some things. Like anytime you start a new job, there's things there you got to learn what that is or learn what certain things mean. Anytime you take on something new, you're going to learn something. Wouldn't you hate it if you, I mean, what, you, just, you just can't open a Bible and expect to know everything. You have to learn. That's a part of anything. But for the most part, it's easy to understand. But the seducing spirits, they want to take away the simplicity. And people are giving heed to seducing spirits. They're giving heed to doctrines of devils. And then it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Hypocrites. Hypocrites pretend to be something that they're not. Like in Revelation 2.20, Jezebel, this woman named Jezebel, it says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So she's, a, she's a, got a seducing spirit behind her. 
and she's calling herself a prophetess. She's speaking lies in hypocrisy. She's pretending to be something that she's not. And she's speaking lies. She's teaching lies. You got a lot of people speaking lies in hypocrisy. They're pretending to be something they're not. Most of these uh, pastors you see on the internet and on TV, they're claiming to be a pastor from God. They're claiming to be a teacher from God. But they're not. They're just speaking lies and hypocrisy. And they have their conscience seared with a hot iron. You can't tell me that these people's consciences aren't seared. They couldn't do what they're doing. They could not get up in front of thousands of people and have millions of people, literally millions of people hearing them on TV and online and not have a seared conscience. They're up there l lying through their teeth, pretending to be able to possibly heal people, speak in tongues, and all these other things, telling flat-out lies, teaching flat-out false doctrines, doctrines of devils, for money, making merchandise of people, with feigned words making merchandise of you. They have to have a seared conscience. They're making millions and millions of dollars all by using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their conscience has to be seared with the hot iron. The average man can't do that. You know, you get you take a a, a drunk or drug addict, people you you see you see in a drug house somewhere, their conscience isn't seared that bad. That's people that's just messed up with their flesh. These big time pastors today, they're messed up spiritually. They're led by seducing spirits. Their doctrines are doctrines of devils. They have their conscience seared with a hot iron. They're speaking lies in hypocrisy, pretending to be something that they're not. So, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and false doctrine is always... Soaked in hypocrisy. <clears throat> when you find a false doctrine, you're going to find a lot of hypocrisy that goes along with it. Now, he, now it said, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the devils have doctrine. And that's what they want to spread. See, the devils know the right doctrine. The devils believe in God and they tremble. The devils know that Jesus Christ is God. They said, what have I, what is, what is that has to do with us, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? They said, "Has did you come to torment us before the time? They know about hell. So the devils know the right doctrine, and they want to give you the wrong doctrine. The devils know the way that God wants you to live, and they want to teach you this other way to live. And now here's some of their doctrines in verse 3. Forbidding to marry. Isn't that crazy? That's a doctrine of a devil. When somebody says that you should not get married or you can't get married, that's a doctrine of a devil. That's completely none of their business whether or not you get married or not. There's even some Baptist uh, preachers that are like that. They say, if you've been divorced, you can't get married until your spouse that you divorced dies. Like, they'll take like a, let's say a young couple got married, like 20 years old, and then the man's wife leaves him. They'll say, they'll tell that man, they'll say, you can't get married until your spouse dies or you're committing adultery. That's not true because she left him. She departed from him. That sin's on her. She's the adulteress. There was no sin on his part. He can be remarried and it not be a sin. So they're forbidding to marry. They're commanding to abstain from meats. That's another doctrine of a devil. And But the forbidding to marry thing, you know, the, like the Catholic Church, the vows of celibacy and stuff where the, the priests aren't allowed to get married, 
the nuns or whatever are not allowed to get married. That's a doctrine of a devil. That's why you see a lot of sexual sin involved in that. So they forbid to marry, even in spite of Hebrews 13.4. Why would you forbid to marry if you've read Hebrews 13.4? It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So marriage is an honorable thing. And 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7 is the greatest chapter on marriage for me and you today in the church age because it was given to us by Paul here. He, he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. See, if you uh, are burning in your lust, then it's better for you to get married. Now, if you have the gift like Paul did where you didn't need a woman, you didn't need to be married, and you could just go through life without burning in lust, then it would be better for you to just go through life and just doing the things of the Lord. But the average person, most people don't have that gift. They need to mar marry or they're gonna, just going to burn in their lust. That's one of the reasons why you should not go around forbidding people to marry. And that's why these... Uh, priests and stuff get into all this sexual sin they're burning in lust it's probably leading them into um, stuff they shouldn't be looking at and then their mind just gets led away with these seducing spirits and they got all these doctrines of devils and then what do they end up doing you know what they end up doing so forbidding to marry definitely a doctrine of a devil 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So marriage, the number one reason to marry is to avoid fornication, to avoid getting into all this sexual sin, to avoid fornication, to avoid pornication, you know, the pornography stuff. Get married. Uh, the cure for sexual sin is for a man to get married and be faithful, try his best to be faithful to his wife. A woman, get married, be faithful to her husband. Try her best to be faithful to her own husband. That's how you avoid fornication. Or if you, if you don't get married <clears throat> and you're just going around burning in your lust, it's going to be hard to avoid fornication. So, forbidding to marry, definitely a doctrine of a devil. 1 Corinthians 9, 5 says, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and, and Cephas? So, Paul is saying he could get married if he wanted to. He's got the power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles. And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, Cephas is Peter, and Peter was married. You know, they say Peter was the first pope, but Peter was married. And they don't, the popes don't get married now. The priests don't get married. So how was uh, Peter the first pope? He wasn't a very good one, if he was then. So forbidding to marry, that's a doctrine of a devil. The Catholic vow of celibacy. The fundies teaching that remarriage is living in adultery. That's doctrines of devils. And then commanding to abstain from meats. That's another doctrine of a devil. Let's look at some verses on that. Commanding to abstain from meats. Colossians 2.16 Colossians 2.16 Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he said, let no man therefore judge you in meat. Nobody has the right to tell you what you, what meat you can eat and can not eat. That's none of their business, what I'm eating. And we're not living under the Old Testament law to where I can't eat certain things. So that's a doctrine of a devil to teach that. And then, 
What else does Paul tell Timothy? He says you can eat it if you can receive it with thanksgiving. Look at 1 Timothy 4.4 4 in the chapter we're reading. He says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So if you you take any food, if you can receive it with thanksgiving, if you can pray over it and say, The Lord, thank you for this food. You can eat it. I mean, I wouldn't advise eating cats and dogs and stuff. That's nasty. But really, I, I have no right to tell you that you can't do that or that that's a sin. Every creature of God is good. It's kind of nasty to me, but I can't sit and tell you that you can't do that. <clears throat> Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. You can have pork. It can be received with thanksgiving. You can have shrimp. It's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. It's set apart. It's sanctified food. When you pr you can pray over it and receive it with thanksgiving. So it's a doctrine of a devil to forbid to marry. It's a doctrine of a devil to command somebody to abstain from meat. Now, if you don't want to eat meat, if that's something you don't want to do, then that's fine too. But you can't push that on people. That's your choice. See, it says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So it's a devilish doctrine that tries to put you back under the law, commanding to abstain from meats, but you believe and know the truth. He says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. When somebody... Tells you to abstain from meat, show them 1 Timothy 4 4. It's, say, it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. He says in verse 6 If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast obtained, attained. So if you want to be a good member, a good minister, put people in remembrance of these things. Put them in remembrance that <clears throat> we're not under the law. We're not under the Old Testament law where they had to ab abstain from meats. You can get married because it's better to marry than to burn. To avoid fornication, get married. Put them in remembrance that the Spirit speaks expressly. It speaks plainly. But that we have seducing spirits going around. We got another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit going around. And they're teaching these doctrines of the devils. They're speaking these lies in hypocrisy. They're speaking lies, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And they're doing it in hypocrisy. Because they're not really who they say they are. They're not really doing the stuff that they preach. And they have to have their conscience seared with a hot iron. Much worse than... The average drunk on the street has. Put the brethren in remembrance of these things. And if you do, you're led of the right spirit. John 14, 26. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. See, the Spirit speaks expressly, and it speaks by the Word of God. What you've learned through the Word of God, it puts those things into your remembrance. And then when you, as the minister, put the Word of God to people's remembrance, you're being led of the right spirit and not a seducing spirit. So I'll put the brethren in remembrance of these things, the things we first talked about. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. You see, God is more concerned with your spiritual diet than your physical diet. 
You got all these people going around talking about abstaining from certain foods, abstaining from certain meats. And, you know, you could go through the shelf at the grocery store and look at all the bad stuff that's in all the food and how everything's going to give you cancer. Everything's going to kill you. Everything's going to do this. Everything's going to do that. And that's just putting a lot of fear in people. I mean, I know that food is bad. The food we eat is bad. And you could spend your life looking at all the food and how bad it is. But when it comes right down to it, there's nothing I can do about it. That's I believe that that's God's judgment on this country for its sin. And since I'm here, even though I'm a child of God, I'm in this sinful country. And I'm going to feel the effects of God's judgment on this country a little bit. I don't... Obviously, as a child of God, the wrath, God's wrath on this country is not on me, but I'm feeling the effects of it. And I believe the food that we eat is one of, um, is, is God's judgment on this country. It's not good food. But I mean, if I just sit and focus all my time on what I'm putting in me, I'm not going to have time for the word of God. But at the same time, there's people that that are all into that and being healthy and things like that, and that's okay too. But I, I'm just not one that I don't just sit and worry about the food I'm eating. I just, I'm just trying to survive. So God's more concerned with your spiritual diet than He is your physical diet. He wants to do, uh, a good minister to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. And I should be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Now look what he says. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. You see that? He's, he's not so much concerned with your, your nourishment when it comes to your food. He's more concerned with your spiritual nourishment of the words of faith and of good doctrine. See, people get so tied up in being healthy physically, but they're led away by seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, by these people speaking lies and hypocrisy that got their conscience here with the hot iron, that got these doctrines of devils commanding to abstain from meats and forbidding to marry, and they're not being nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. When it, They may be all good physically, all in shape physically, eating the right foods physically. They know what food has this and that in it and that they shouldn't eat it and that if they eat it, it's going to give them cancer or kill them. But they don't know about the words of faith and the good doctrine. So they're mal malnourished when it comes to their spiritual diet. God's more concerned with your spiritual diet. He wants you to have good doctrine. What's good doctrine? Well, that's your teaching. Your doctrine is your, your set of beliefs, your teachings. In Titus 2, 7, it says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness. So you want your doctrine to be so pure and sound. That your, should be your primary focus. You know, most pastors today, they don't teach doctrine. They teach just the practical stuff. They just teach the basic stuff, the milky stuff, no diving into the doctrines and really breaking it down and explaining it. Explaining it. You want to break the doctrines down so thoroughly that the people get it and understand it, and then they won't get led away with these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You see, that's the purpose of us getting together. That's why he gave pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, so that you can know the right doctrine and you won't be led away and then you can give the right doctrine to others. But that's not what people use the getting, uh, assembling together is about anymore. They think it's about everything else but that, having a big, a big time and all this. No, it's about getting together, breaking down the Word of God, expounding it and giving them the good doctrine. So he says, in doctrine showing uncorruptness. 
in Titus 1 and verse 9, he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So you need to know the doctrine so that you can exhort and that you can advance, convince the gainsayers because there's a whole bunch of vain talkers and deceivers going around speaking lies and their mouths must be stopped. And you're not going to be able to put it into them if you don't know the good doctrine. They're teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That means they're doing it for money. They're teaching these lies and hypocrisy led by seducing spirits. It's all for money. Their conscience is seared. That's how they can make all this money off the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and not feel bad about it. Their conscience is seared. And if you don't know the good doctrine, you're going to be deceived by them. If you don't give the people that you teach the Bible to the good doctrine, they're going to end up being deceived by those people. And that's going to be on you for not teaching them. It's a very important thing to break down the doctrine. That's why God gave us the Bible, was primarily for doctrine. But doctrine has been thrown on the shelf. Nobody cares about doctrine anymore. They just want a bunch of uh, fancy songs, flashy stuff, and it's disgusting. And like you read back there in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1. God's talking about how he hates all this stuff that they're doing. They're doing all these sacrifices and offerings. He says, I hate your solemn meetings. You get over there in Amos. He says, I hate that your songs. I hate this and that. It's like they're doing all this stuff for the Lord, supposedly. But it's really just all a flashy mess making themselves look good. That's what... You, I mean, you just look, I'm not being critical. Anytime you say stuff like this, they say, well, you're just being critical. You got a critical spirit. You're just jealous. I'm not jealous of these people. I wouldn't want to trade places with these people for millions and millions of dollars. God wanted to be me to be me, so I want to be me because that's who God obviously wanted me to be. I don't want to be these other people. I'm just telling you, the focus has shifted from the Bible and doctrine to a bunch of flashy songs, flashy preaching, and it's disgusting. It's almost like a mockery to me. When I see it, and it's, it's uh, they're puffing up the flesh, it's a mockery to God. It's a mockery to God and preaching, and it's just puffing up your flesh. You have threw away the Bible, and it, you made it all about you and trying to trying to look good. When you preach and teach, you don't want people to become impressed with you. You want them to be impressed with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible. You show them amazing things about the Lord Jesus Christ. You show them amazing things about the Word of God. It's like I want to show them all these amazing things about God and the Bible. And you can see it on their face when you say it. This amazing thing about the Bible. And it's like you can see their eyes be enlightened. And they're impressed with the Word of God. That's the goal. Not to make yourselves look good. You want to nourish them up in the words of faith and good doctrine. And that's not going on. They're malnourished. They got all these flashy songs. They're, they're feeling all these different types of emotions from these songs. So they're crying, obviously. And it looks like, well, wow, they're, they're having this big revival. They're getting right with God. But are they really? Because, you know, you could play... I mean, you could get up and play a song, that song that was on the Titanic movie by Celine Dion, who's a wicked woman, and get people in the altar because it's going to make them cry. It's going to make them feel a certain way, especially women because women are emotional, more emotional than men. And, but you, you, got all the, you get all these emotional songs and then you get all these stories 
You get all these emotional stories that they do now. And obviously, people's going to go to the altar. And they're going to supposedly get right with God. But then what about Monday? What about Tuesday? And the rest of the week? See, they're not leading them to the Word of God. They're making all these emotional-based decisions. And if you make your decisions just based on emotion, then another emotion through the week is going to take you away from that decision that you just made. But if everything you're doing is based on the Word of God, and everything that you do and believe goes back to the Word of God, and you're in the Word of God every day, then that's going to keep you all week. That's going to keep you all month. That's going to keep you throughout your entire Christian life. It's not based on these emotions that come and go. It's based on the facts of the Word of God, and you've got the good doctrine, and you know the doctrine. So then that's how you lead your Christian life. The doctrine, Bible teaching, it's been put on the shelf. Nobody cares anymore. It's about being flashy. It's about getting a rise out of people, getting... a. a or all these results that they're looking for. But it says, Refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So see, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Don't so much worry about bodily exercise. Worry about spiritual exercise. He says, For body exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So you see, godliness, exercising thyself to godliness, is profitable unto all things. It's got promise of this life now and of that which is to come. You see that? Whereas bodily exercise, contrast it with bodily exercise, it's only profitable in the life that now is. So be strict in your spiritual food. Be strict in your spiritual exercise. Uh, but people are malnourished. They're not taking care of themselves, spiritually speaking. They're taking in false doctrine. They're worried about going to the gym physically, running on a treadmill, lifting weights. But they're not worried about spiritual exercise. They're worried about refusing certain foods but they don't show much care for their spiritual diet you know the bible talks about in hebrews having your senses exercised it says in hebrews 5:14 actually let's look at Hebrews 5.12, for, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You need to put your mind through these spiritual exercises by reading the Word of God, by studying the Word of God, by memorizing the Scriptures, by praying to God. Have your senses exercised so you can discern both good and evil. You can discern the seducing spirits from the Holy Spirit. You, you'll, you'll be able to know what's a doctrine of a devil and what's the good doctrine. You'll be able to know who's speaking lies and who hypocrisy and who's the real deal. You'll be able to know that these forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats are doctrines of devils. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Be more concerned with your spiritual diet than your physical diet. Godliness is profitable unto all things. He says in verse 7 of 1 Timothy 4, Refuse profane and old wives' fables. So you re refuse... The, see, all this stuff that we've been talking about, this is just old wives' profane stuff and old wives' fables, all these things. Forbidding to marry. 
commanding to abstain from meats. Refuse those things. You think about old wives, think about the cult. Mary Baker Eddy started the Christian science stuff. She's an old wife. She's just an old wives fable. The L and G White, the Seventh Day Adventist stuff, that's just old wives fables. Refuse that stuff and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Joyce Meyer, that stuff she said, that's just an old wise fable. You want to refuse that stuff and get into the Word of God. A fable. What is a fable? It's just an idle story. It's fiction, not faith unfeigned. So you want to get involved in faith unfeigned. That's real faith. Faith that's unpretended. What is profane? It's pro Do you want to stay away from profane and old wise fables? What's profane? It's irreverent. It's not purified or holy. And you want to exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Hebrews 5.14, that verse I, I told you. Having your senses exercised. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14. Or no, 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. See, you're running a spiritual race. Not so much worried about running on a treadmill. We're running a spiritual race. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Not like a boxer, but he's fighting a spiritual battle. He's doing spiritual exercises. So it's about spiritual exercise. Not bodily exercise. It's about your spiritual health. Not so much about your physical.